Absolutely. You know, my feelings, I think, are exactly the same as those of everybody else across the country. You know, two days on, I still feel stunned and just overwhelmingly sad about what happened to Jo. Uh, I didn't know her personally, but absolutely everything I've read about her and heard about her since Thursday makes me wish desperately that I had known her. Uh, she appears to have been everything that you would want an elected representative to be, passionate and committed, somebody driven by belief and conviction, hugely energetic and very accessible to the public, which we all try to be. And that accessibility, of course, is one of the hallmarks of our democracy and something we must not allow to be undermined. Uh, but above all else, and more important than all of that, Jo was a mum of two young children. And, you know, I'm not the only one, far from being the only one whose heart just breaks every time I think of those kids just now. And uh, I suppose the, the comfort is knowing that they'll grow up knowing just what a wonderful person their mother was and how proud of her they should be and everybody else should be of her. And you think part of our legacy could be, you, you talked, uh, didn't you, about a, a new beginning for our politics flowing from this. Could you just expand on that? Hmm. Well, I know how I feel personally, um, I have felt personally in these last couple of days. It's, you know, as a politician, you know, I, I feel inspired by her example to, to rededicate myself to politics and public service as a force for good. You know, all too often people vilify and criticise politicians and, and much of that is perfectly legitimate. We're public servants. We are there to be held to account and that's right and proper but we're also in the overwhelming majority of cases people who come into politics for the right reasons we you know if this isn't too much of a cliche we come into politics because in our different ways we want to make the world a better place and i think uh, i will not be alone in, in wanting to rededicate myself to that but i also hope that part of joe's legacy will be you know a political discourse that is perhaps uh, less vitriolic and less cruel and less harsh. You know, I, I don't think from what I know uh, or have learned about or what I've read about, I don't think she would want us to become less passionate in how we debate politics, but perhaps she would want us to be more respectful and recognise that our political opponents, by and large, are just that, opponents with a different view of how we make the world a better place, not enemies who are badly motivated. And if that can lead to a more respectful discourse, then that will be one aspect of what I am sure will be a huge and very positive legacy of Joe Cox. OK, let me uh, ask you about uh, the uh, upcoming vote we're all aware of on uh, the, the UK's place inside or, or outside the European Union. Now, you've talked, um, didn't you, uh, last week about putting contingency plans in place uh, for Scotland. What are they? Well, you know, I think you would expect me as First Minister of Scotland to be looking at all eventualities and making sure that we're planning for those eventualities. I, I've said, you know, I'll say again today what I've said a million times. If Scotland votes to stay in the European Union, and, you know, what I'm about to say is predicated on Scotland voting to stay in, although I don't take that for granted. But if we then face the prospect of being taken out of the EU against our will, then of course we would have to look at all options to protect our relationship with the European Union and give effect to how the Scottish people had voted in our manifesto for the Scottish elections that we fought the election on just last month said that one option that the Scottish Parliament should have the right to consider is another independence referendum. So I'm not saying anything there that I've not said a million times before. But I will also say again today, and I've said this often before too, I hope this scenario doesn't arise. I fervently and passionately hope that people right across the UK and in every part of the UK vote to remain in the European Union. And not just because I think that will be better for our economy, for jobs and trade, although staying part of the world's single biggest, uh, biggest single market will certainly be all of that. But it's also, I think, a big and a fundamental decision about the kind of world we want to be part of. I want to be living in a country, part of a world where independent nations choose to work together, where we're open and outward looking and inclusive. And I think a vote to leave the EU would be a vote to be uh, closed and inward looking. And I don't think that's right mm. for the UK or any part of the UK. 
But if it is a vote to leave, and whether Scotland votes overall in or out, then negotiations have to start. And would your feeling be that it couldn't just be UK representatives, UK officials doing that? Because there are so many now devolved powers that the Scottish Parliament has that there would have to be Scottish officials, specifically Scottish officials, negotiating on some of those details. Oh, absolutely. Scotland's voice would have to be heard and, and heard directly in, in those circumstances. I'm very clear about that. Uh, but, you know, in a very strong sense, these are uh, discussions for after Thursday, and I hope they're discussions that don't have to happen, uh, because I'll go back to the central point, and we're still a few days away from polling day. Uh, I think it's really important that those of us who want to see a Remain vote, those of us who want to see the UK and all of the nations in the UK stay part of Europe, stay part of the world, stay outward looking and open and inclusive, make that case. And that's what I'll be doing over these next few days. And I very much hope that what we see on Thursday is a strong vote for Remain, not just in Scotland, but England, Wales, Northern Ireland as, as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. And where will you be uh, doing that campaigning, Miss Sturgeon? Uh, as you no doubt know, a uh, pretty popular south of the border as well. Are you going to be making uh, any forays south in the next few days? Um, I've, I've been uh, south of the border in the last couple of weeks. Uh, as you may know, I took part in a debate uh, UK-wide uh, and was in London at the end of last week. I, I don't plan to be south of the border for the remainder of the campaign. I'll be campaigning in Scotland uh, this week and I'll be very strongly making the case that uh, people in Scotland should vote to remain. Uh, and I hope that message will be one that's relevant to uh, and will resonate with people right across the UK. I, I think there are and, you know, I would say to people, you don't have to believe everything that David Cameron or the UK Treasury says here. I think, you know, as First Minister, I look at the evidence. My judgment is that economically, socially, culturally, we're better off remaining as part of the EU. You know, we live in a world that is increasingly interdependent. I'm a nationalist. I want Scotland to be independent. But I believe with everything I've got that in the world we live in, independent countries much reach out and work together. I, I don't want the UK to... Uh, be inward looking and to close itself off. And the, the other point I would make is in these last few days, I hope we can have a, a debate that doesn't focus uh, on immigration. Yes, people's concerns about immigration need to be addressed, but let's also make the positive case for a world and, and a Europe where we all have the freedom of travel and the positive case for immigration and the benefits that bring uh, to our economy. And I would say, you know, right. on that point, that the poster that Nigel Farage unveiled last week was vile and racist. And I know you're going to be speaking to him uh, later on, and I hope he does agree today to withdraw that poster, because that kind of sentiment has no place in a civilised debate. So you want me to tell him it's vile and racist, in, in your opinion? Was it not, though, touching on people's concerns about the overall number of, of people who come through the EU well, let, let, and might make their way to the European, uh, might make their way to the UK? Let me be clear. I, I don't take the view that people who uh, have concerns about immigration are racist. That's not what I'm saying. I do think Nigel Farage's poster was racist. But my argument about immigration is if people have concerns about the impact of immigration. And I'm sitting here in Glasgow, actually, in my own constituency. Uh, a couple of miles from here, there's a part of my constituency where there's a real impact from recent Eastern European immigration. But my argument is let's deal with the impact. Let's invest in housing and public services rather than blame immigrants or uh, take a, a view that we should somehow close our borders. Inward migration is good for our economy. You know, you've, you hear the Leaf campaign saying we've got record levels of inward migration. We've also got record high levels of employment across the UK right now. Uh, economies that are open and welcoming and inclusive are, generally speaking, more successful than those that close themselves with, off. With, so uh, with no uh, limits, migrants First Minister? Make, uh, migrants from the rest of the EU make a... Well, you know, it's not the case that we don't have controls on uh, immigration. Some of those controls, uh, I, I think, lead to cases like one we've got in Scotland just now, where a, a couple and their child from Australia came here under the post-study uh, work visa rules with an expectation of being able to stay. Those rules were changed and now they face the prospect of having to leave. They've got a massive contribution to make. The point I'm making is let's have a balanced and proper debate about immigration, not one in which people's legitimate concerns are exploited in a way that is uh, designed to encourage people to turn inwards. That's what the Leave leadership, I think, have been doing, and I think it is deeply regrettable. And lastly, 
if, if I were a, 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 an SNP uh, voter living in, in Scotland, listening to what you've said, Ms Sturgeon, what well, wouldn't some of them be drawing the conclusion, given what you've said about Scotland's relationship with the European Union, wouldn't some of them be draw the conclusion that on Thursday it would be best perhaps uh, to vote no or to abstain because then you would get a step closer perhaps to another independence referendum? <laughs> no, there's no logic to that at all. You know, what I'm, my vote for Remain on Thursday will not be driven by considerations about what it means for an independent Scotland. Uh, you know I believe in an independent Scotland, but my vote for Remain will be about many other reasons. But what I'm saying to people uh, who perhaps support independence, who are considering their vote on Thursday uh, based on what they think it means for Scottish independence, if Scotland votes leave, then that uh, premise for independence isn't there. You know, if Scotland votes to remain and faces being taken out of Europe against their will, then yes, I think the option of a second independence referendum has to be on the table for consideration. But that argument's not there if Scotland also votes to leave. If Scotland votes to leave and there's a leave vote across the whole of the UK, then our immediate future is Scotland in the UK, out of Europe, facing a UK government led by the likes of Boris Johnson that, if it's possible to believe this, would be even more right-wing than that led by David Cameron and George Osborne. That's not the kind of uh, situation I want to see arise. So if, if that's your consideration as a, an independence supporter, then the only logical thing to do is to vote Remain. First Minister, great talking to you. Thank you very much indeed for your time, Nicola Sturgeon there. Thank you very much.